Good afternoon. Apologies for my uh, voice. I ran out of voice. But uh, we're going to be talking about Cobia, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge my uh, colleagues, my co-authors who are here, who are present, um, and uh, also C Grant, Noah, which has funded most of the R&D, and simply put, Cobia Aquaculture in the Americas wouldn't exist if it weren't for the seed money and continuing funding, and also because of the private sector. But we're going to get to it as we, as we move on. Uh, well, Cobia has, uh, needs no introduction. We all know about it. Extraordinary growth rates, extraordinary good characteristics for aquaculture. And so when we started doing this in the early 2000, 2001, we, um, we estimated, we projected a lot of uh, fast growth. And uh, you can read on and, and see, because I'm not going to be talking too much with this voice, but the reality is that all the, 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 the prospects were great. And we anticipated and we projected a lot of positive fast growth. And in the end of the day, the question in our mind was just how to improve, how to increase production, because it was just a matter of economy of scale. And uh, the question in our minds was how and where to go, not if we're going to do it. And, uh, and then what is it that is taking so long to, for those predictions to materialize? And that's what we're going to see uh, next. And indeed, the production, this is the world uh, production of Cobia. And this is a courtesy of the Global Aquaculture Alliance. As you can see, there was an exponential growth, basically, in the year 2000 and so in that decade, because it was a fever, and everybody wanted to get in, including in the Americas, as we will see next, several countries try to do, and most of them are no longer in business. We will also see the reasons for that. And obviously, when, once China got, it started in Taiwan, but once China, China got into the picture, it grew exponentially. But uh, since the year the, the 2012 here, the production in China has actually decreased. And there are reasons for that. It's because they could not keep up with Cobia. The nutritional and, and, and environmental requirements of Cobia were simply too high for the Chinese to continue. So they were replacing with pampano, with um, yellow croaker, and other species. But Cobia stabilized. And then Panama, which is the only, the only uh, company producing nowadays, got into the picture, but it's still relatively low. And Vietnam as well. There is a, I, I have a list of uh, all the countries that are producing and that were producing are no longer producing. Uh, but then we get back to our hatchery at the University of Miami, experimental hatchery. Our facilities are relatively modest, uh, but it has truly be, uh, become a, uh, an incubator of technology. We do a lot of good work there. And uh, mostly uh, due to our graduate students. It's all about the people, as you, as you can see. We started small by the year 2000. And many of these uh, graduate students back then now are professionals. They are all over the world leading the field, taking charge. It's something that fills us with pride because it's unbelievable. And again, kudos to NOVA, to C Grant, because they were the ones funding a lot of these graduate students that are now leaders in the industry. Uh, so we conducted over the last two decades collectively, not just us, but let's focus on our facilities here. We conducted you know, research and development and, and developed technologies. We transferred to the industry. We trained people. Most of them are working in other, not just with COVID, but in other facilities. So we did our homework, quite frankly. And as you can tell, this picture tells it all. It's all about the fish, the fish is in the center, and the people hands-on. Everybody works hard. In fact, they're the ones. Our students are running our hatchery now because we're all here. So they're back there working. And this is what we do. We don't have, to, we don't have time to go over any of, our, or any of these details, but uh, we, we started with a selective breeding program, which have, we have been developed. We look at the, the broodstock, this volitional spawning year-round. All of this has been published. John Stiglitz published with all of us as co-authors on year-round spawning. Uh, larval reading technology also published. The whole process is, you know, we have a very strong uh, uh, nutrition program led by Dr. Horace Suarez, who is also co-author, is here. 
falling a little short on the disease uh, control here because there are issues still, uh, but we will talk briefly about it. And um, we also, yeah, we, I mentioned this, but we also work on site selection, environmental monitoring. We just published a paper this year on the journal, the World Aquaculture Society, about environmental monitoring, which is negligible. And also we do business and production planning project development. This is our facility. Uh, we are the first and probably perhaps the only research and academic hatchery in the world that is Global Gap certified. We do not just with COBE, but we apply this, we use the systems for just for a number of species. And we try to use a proactive health management approach in which we rely on, you know, in prophylaxis, in, in using uh, probiotics, etc. We do recognize this is major here, the microbiological control of the environment and the microbiome of the fish. This is the name of the game. We realize that not only for COBE, but mostly for other species that are more sensitive and difficult to grow. I like to show this slide because it shows how simple, relatively simple, our maturation systems are, but they are the standard nowadays. We have built, I lost the count, but easily about 50 of those, if not more, for maybe 20 species or so. All of them are very, um, very operative, it works well. Many of our former students are here, now managers of hatches. This is what we build. It works phenomenally, this system. The fish, we condition the fish to spawn. The water quality is crystal clear and everything else. Again, no details, no time for the details, but our Cobia broodstock management is truly, pardon the word, but it's spectacular because we have been spawning on and off season this fish for the last 15 years. And the egg quality is very good. We pay attention to the details. We do a lot of science. Uh, we're very pragmatic, though. But this, for example, is one detail. We create the symbiosis in the system that we, um, we have a cleaning station with a uh, young goby, for example, which establishes the self there in the substrate and, and cleans up the fish. So it's something truly nice. Uh, if I had time, I would elaborate on that. We also, as I said, uh, there is science behind everything we do, and we optimize our production technology through physiology and bioenergetic research. We have these swimming chambers, and we study the, you know, the, everything about the fish. So it helps a lot because when we develop a technology, when we perfect the technology, it's based on science. In the end of the day, it's all about improving the ecological and economical sustainability or feasibility or, or efficiency of that. Uh, feeds, need, needless to say, we have a very strong program. That's where the money is, and that's where the ecological efficiency isn't. So it's led by Dr. Jorge Suarez. And again, with everything that we do, we focus on the large fish. We don't study nutritional requirements of small fish because it's, it's not important. It doesn't really matter. We use 5% of the, the, the diets on that. It is the large fish that matters, where we use 80% of all feeds. And so Dr. Jorge leads this program. We have uh, you know, support from certain groups. We have a, a collaboration with Higashima from Japan that produces outstanding diet. In fact, they are up here. They have a diet for, for hirami, for the uh, flatfish that we are. We have no uh, pigment abnormals. We have anything to do with that. Uh, again, the aim of the program at the end of the day is to improve the ecological and economic efficiency of feeds. And, and just to reiterate, we've published about all this, so if you look it up, you will find. The selective breeding program is a relatively simple one. It's again funded by Open Blue, and again, kudos to them, because if aquaculture of Kobe in the Americas would not exist if it weren't for them. Um, and it's a, it's a simple Mendelian approach in which we, we aim at, a, we target an F2 offsprings that are superior quality because we select the best of uh, uh, the best males of one family, for example, with, and crossbreed with the best females or another family. And the result is a species that, uh, and that's where we are at now, which is pretty good. And with that, combining everything, we have, you know, developed reliable production uh, of high quality cobia fingerlings. Now, these are just so that you have an idea. The countries that are, that 
are currently producing or have cultured cobia. But guess what? Most of them are no longer in production. This is just the ones that I know because we are directly or indirectly involved with. And again, there is no funding, and there is our training programs in just about all of them. So, except for Taiwan, all of these other countries, we had had involvement, directly or indirectly. We're not going to go over all of this, but they have not only done, but they have tried in tanks, in ponds, in grass, near shore and offshore cages, you name it. And why is all that? Why is it uh, everybody went crazy about cobia? Because of its extraordinary growth rate. They grow ten times faster than most Perciforms, teleost, you name it. Stopper, uh, you know, cobia, pumpkin, snook, grouper, you name it. And three times faster even than the fast growers such as cerula. So cobia and mahi are amongst or perhaps the fastest uh, growth rates ever recorded for teleost. But that comes at cost, and we shall see next. Okay, of course, they can grow fast. They, the scope for growth is incredible. They can reach six kilos in one year, but they can also reach one kilo in one year, depending on the diets and the environment that they are raised. Here, interesting summary of what we, we have learned. Uh, they grow twice as fast at low density and high temperature. Twice than, than that at high density and low temperature. But again, do we want to raise fish or make money? At low density and high temperature, you can't make money. And on the top of everything, gases become less uh, soluble as, as temperature rises. So the higher the temperature, the lower the oxygen level, which is what they need the most. It is oxygen rather than food supply that limits growth rates in fish, and particularly in high metabolic rates fish like this. So again, you can see here, they can grow under ideal conditions 21 grams per, per week or per day, in fact, 21 grams per day. But it can also go, grow six, depending on what's happening. We're talking about orders of magnitude. We're not going to go there. I have a, a sword on my back here already. But it's all published. <laughs> Just very quickly, I'm, I'm getting to the point. Open Blue, I, again, needless to say, they are, one, they are doing a great job. They are, the, they are the only game in town. It's not that they're the best. They are the only uh, meaningful uh, production of coal in the Americas. And for those of you who don't know, this is the farm of the future, not just for cobia. If we are targeting the produ production of 20, 30 million metric tons in the next 20 years, it's going to have to be in the offshore environment fully automated. It's not going to be in the coastal environment. It's not going to be in RAS. This is the only way. Somebody has to take the bullet, and they have been taking the bullet. There is no other way. This is the way to go. This is what Innova C is doing automating systems. You have 22 cages here that you don't even see producing 2,000 uh, tons of cobia a year. This is what you see when you get close to it. This is what you see inside. Uh, harvesting and all the operations is quite spectacular what you see inside the cages. And again, the, but all that costs operational and capital costs extremely high. Technology has to be advanced. So the production cost of this fish, to get this fish, is extremely expensive. So they have to go into a high price in the market to make it work. And that's where the problems reside. We have had enormous, uh, an incredible amount of, of troubles over the last two decades. But for the most of it, quite frankly, we've been resolving them. We had mortalities at all levels, shark attacks, etc. But we're getting better and better, to, you know. Now, this is, okay, conclusions. Uh, well, is cobia aquaculture still a pie in the sky or money in the bank? I, I like to use this kind of uh, analogy or whatever. The market is still underdeveloped, and partially because cobia are not very well known, but also partially because the, the high price point that is driven by those production, all those costs that I was mentioning, places them into act, uh, actually these, these high production costs are driven by all these exceptionally high environmental and nutritional requirements. FCRs, biologically, we can do 1.5, but in the end, what matters is the economical conversion, which is always above 2, to say the least, because there is still high mortality due to disease. And uh, there is still a lack of depth 
in depth of knowledge of the nutritional requirements at all life stages. We do not know the digestibility of most of the ingredients used for the specialized diets. We still need to learn about it. Uh, so aquaculture of Kobe, I mean, it's been 20 years already. It's time. Uh, but it's still relatively new compared to other established industries. So he went through all these stages here from the R&D to the demonstration, increased the activities, and et cetera, et cetera. And now it's finally maturing. Many people went out of business. A lot of people lost money on that. And it's finally expanding to commercial side. Uh, they have exceptionally high biological characteristics for aquaculture, but some uh, improvements still must be made before it go, goes mainstream, such a, as a salmon, for example. So in spite of all the progress that we have made, there's still some issues to be resolved. And these are the major issues I can identify. I think most of us working with Cobia would agree with that. We have to control disease. We have to improve the feeds. And we have to improve the market. So getting there. So again, the breeding program, the breeding program and genetic improvements and monosex production are still at early stages, although we are on it, we are doing. Uh, they are susceptible to parasites and bacterial diseases, and yet vaccines development targeting specific diseases is still at the early stages as well. So the bottom line, this is the bottom line here, is that their nutritional and environmental requirements are proportional to their growth rates, meaning 10 times higher than a normal fish and so it's very difficult to meet those nutritional and environmental requirements. The only way to do this is to go offshore, where the production costs are extremely high, in high energy levels. So do, uh, the high oxygen requirement, the only way I think that COBE can be raised successfully in mass production is in the offshore environment. There's no other way. Near shore, land-based ponds, RAS, tanks, you name it, Many have trialed and all failed. So the, I think I don't want to be repetitive here, but uh, this is the take home message. And uh, all these positions go at the high price point, competing in a market of white fish that offers other uh, cheaper op alternatives. But nonetheless, we remain optimistic because this is, in, in our view, is probably the best fish that you can get into the market. There are a few things that need to be done for this to succeed. Um, you know, we, the prospects remain bright, in our opinion. Uh, the technology is there to solve these problems that we are addressing. Uh, the market must increase, and the production cost must decrease. And we need, basically, vaccines and better feeds. Thank you so much.